Welcome, everybody. Um, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about, uh, in the next 10 minutes or so, about how FERA funds, funds research. And uh, um, just to let you know that I'm just a warm up act, because after me, they'll, you'll hear from three of <laughs> the, the real show are these three investigators. They were supposed to be four, but unfortunately, one of them is not feeling that well. So. But um, I've heard Daryl talk earlier in the previous breakout session, and it's really good. So stick around to to uh, <laughs> to listen to them. And um, so I'm I'm Lisa Rani. I'm the director of research at Fair. And as Kyle um, pointed out yesterday, I'm the one who spends the money that he raises. Uh, <laughs> that's exactly how he introduced me yesterday. Um, so uh, so how you know what? What do we, we use that money that you guys all raise for? Uh, we think that the most um, impactful strategy to uh, fund research is using different mechanisms. And one of these mechanisms is the FERA grant program, which is a way where uh, investigators who have who research FA have ideas, propose to us these ideas, and um, we fund the ones that we think uh, are getting us closer to FAIR's goal and mission, who, that is to find treatments for FA. Uh, the other um, program uh, is in institutional programs like uh, the Center of Excellence in Philadelphia or the FA Accelerator at Abroad, the FA Alliance at Oxford, uh, where we fund group of investigators in specific institutions. These are longer term investments because we want to create this group of multidisciplinary expertise, um, increase the number of investigators that uh, you know are interested in FA and research FA. Um, and also we are trying to leverage some of the resources that these investigations already have. And the thir third way that we uh, fund research is through director project, we call them FIRE director project, where FIRA staff uh, identify some of the biggest challenges, uh, biggest gaps in knowledge uh, of the disease mechanism. And, and we go after investigators and try to get them to answer these questions and, you know, research certain questions that are very important to us and represents the biggest gaps that we have. Um, what I'm going to talk to you about today is mostly uh, about how the grant program works, but generally it also applies to the other uh, mechanism that we uh, apply. So the grant program can be represented as a cycle that uh, starts at end with the knowledge that we have about the disease. And this is important because, of course, uh, that informs on the therapeutic development of the disease. But also, it tells us, uh, once we know exactly what we know, what else do we need to know? So we, it exposes uh, the gaps in knowledge that we have, all those questions that we still have to answer. And these represent our research priorities that we uh, apply uh, when investigators come to us with their ideas. So we use these research priorities that we develop together with our experts in the field, our scientific advisory board. Um, and investigators, we solicit application from investigators investigators uh, so that this research priority can be addressed. Uh, these um, investigators come to us with proposals. We review the proposals um, using experts in the field, and then we fund the ones that we think are able to address better these priorities, answer better these questions. Um, Throughout the, the uh, cycle of the grant, we engage with investigators, we keep in contact with them, review the progress, and then hopefully by the end of the project, we will we'll learn a little bit more about the disease. And we use this knowledge to revise the priorities, the research priority for the following year, so that for the following cycle, uh, so that you know, at each cycle, we learn a little bit more and we revise um, what the big questions that we need to address are, what the, the questions that we want to um, address uh, in FA. 
These are uh, our grant types. And as you can see here, we have different uh, a few cycles over the years, and we have different um, grant types, some that are aimed at um, funding established investigators, some that are aimed at uh, funding young investigators in, in the early stages of their career, like the ones that you see sitting here next to me. Um, other grant types are general. They, you know, the you can uh, propose to us uh, uh, research topics that are very general, um, and others are more specific. For example, we have a grant to study specifically the heart disease in FA, or a grant that uh, in which we fund proposals that are more related to therapeutic development. We also have grants to that encourage new investigators who have never worked in FA to come to the FA field and study FA. Okay, so now a little bit more detail of what we fund and why we fund it. We, what kind of research we fund and why we fund it. And I wanted to start here because to this um, image shows the drug development process. And because obviously, ultimately, uh, is this a pointer? Sort of, because this is our goal, right? To get to an effective treatment in FA. We have a first approved drug, but this is not the end of the road. Um, FA is a very complex disease. You heard it earlier uh, today. We need a cocktail to address all the different components of FA. And, you know, this is how a, a drug is developed. The first stage here is a lot of basic research where you try to understand the disease as much as possible. Um, you try to understand all the molecular processes that are involved in the, um, the manifestation of the disease. And all these molecular processes represent um, therapeutic targets, things that we can target with a drug. And then we have a the next phase is the preclinical development, where all these potential drugs are tested, for example, in cell models, animal models, to determine whether these drugs are indeed uh, efficacious in these models. <clears throat> and also to test, to study a little bit more the property of these potential drugs, like the pharmacological properties, whether they're toxic or not. And then you have clinical trials where these molecules are tested in people. Um, and so, you know, one thing that I wanted to point out to you is that how this, this um, uh, representation of the drug development process, it's kind of a funnel, right? So you see a lot of stuff here, a lot of drugs, a lot of different targets, and then, you know, the number of the drugs become less and less until you get to your, your effective treatment. And this is a very very typical, it's not just FA. Along the way, there's gonna be some failures, there are gonna be a lot of attrition, and this is expected. Uh, but the important thing that I wanna point out to you is that at each stage, all these different uh, activities in each stage are or they are all learning opportunity for, opportunities for us. So what's important to point out is that all these different moments where you, you seem to have a little step back, these are learning opportunities. We'll always learn from these setbacks. And, you know, at every stage of this de development, um, it seems like you're, we're making very small progress, this very incremental um, progress. But if you take it all together, this is a very important, all, all this incremental um, learning is very important to get to us to the finish line, which is a treatment for FA. So what can we do to uh, try to help this, this process, the, the, the drug development process? There are a lot of things that FERA can do and does, um, and in all these different phases. First of all, we fund basic research. We try to understand the disease as much as we can. We try to identify all those pathways that are targetable by drugs. And we try to get as many as those as possible because as I mentioned earlier, there's gonna be attrition. Um, 
then we support preclinical development by mostly by trying to um, develop better tools for academic investigators, for drug development developers to test these drugs. And we support also clinical develop, develop, development, clinical trials, by also trying to develop tools that are important for clinical development, like biomarkers, or trying to understand the disease, the clinical, the clinical aspects of the disease through the natural, his, the natural history studies. And then we take all this information and we engage with uh, the FDA, with regulators, to educate them about the disease and about the tools that we have available to develop drugs. So getting into a little bit more detail of what we fund as far as um, basic research, research is concerned, you've seen this uh, depicted earlier, how we like to um, to um, represent the disease as a process that goes from the mutation that you have in, in, in the DNA inside the cells, the uh, GAA repeat expansion in the FXN gene. This causes the gene to be silenced. This causes the low levels of uh, frataxin protein inside the cell. And this has a lot of different consequences uh, inside the cell, some of which we know, for example, mitochondrial dysfunction or oxidative stress. Um, these dysfunction causes the cell not to function well and sometimes to degenerate. And obviously, when a cell within a tissue doesn't work properly or degenerate, you have also tissue at the um, dysfunction at the tissue level, at the organ level. And this translate into symptoms that all the, um, the FA patients experience. So this is what we know about the disease generally, but we need to know every what happens at every single step. And we need to learn as much as possible about all these different steps because every single step is a therapeutic opportunity. So what are the outstanding questions uh, in all these different steps that characterize the disease. How does the GAA, the, the expansion occur? We still don't have a clear answer there. How are, is the GAA um, silencing the gene? Once, once again, something that we still, we have some answer, but not all the answers. Um, what is the function of frataxin? We know that one of the function of frataxin, the main function as far as we know now is to produce this iron sulfur cluster that are cofactors important for a lot of enzymes inside the cells. But we now know that there might be other function of frataxin. So what are these other functions? Um, then what are all the consequences that uh, when frataxin is lost, what are the consequences inside the cells? Um, and what causes the dysfunction of the cell death? once frataxin is lost. For example, one important question that we have is why are only certain uh, cell types affected? Why are only heart cells and brain cells affected and not skin cells or blood cells? Um, another important question is what happens at the, at the organ level? What happens to the brain? What happens to the heart? And are there um, developmental components of the disease. So are there changes in the disease, for example, in the brain that uh, happens even before um, a person is born? And finally, we don't know a lot about some of the symptoms, for example, fatigue, um, a very important symptom for, for uh, FA years, but we don't know why FA years experience fatigue. What are the molecular mechanisms behind fatigue? And we don't even know exactly how to measure it. And these are some of the examples of grants that we have funded in the last few months that try to address all these questions. And as you can see there, we try to address 
every single one as much as possible to cover all the different questions as much as possible. We have grants from um, uh, investigators, for example, under Nuisance Week at, at the NIH, who's trying to find out why the GAA repeats are expanding. He has a method to uh, visualize the repeat inside the cells and is trying to use that to understand more about why the repeats are getting longer and longer. Um, then we have grants that tackle the uh, silencing. Sanjay Bidichandani is one of the experts in FA who's looking at um, gene silencing. Her grad student, Morgan Tackett, has a grant to, to elucidate that. Uh, and then we have other grants that tackle um, the function of retaxing and, and Angela Xiong at, at Boston College. She's another grad student who's looking at um, what proteins are changing in the cell when frataxin is changed? So what other protein besides frataxin are affected by frataxin loss? And then Don Joseph at CHOP is looking at brain circuits, what happens to the brain connectivity, uh, how the neurons connect to each other when frataxin is low. Um, Lucy Hamet is with um, Helen Puccio um, in France, and she's looking at that last question, one of the last questions that I mentioned, are there neurodevelopmental changes in FA together with neurodegenerative changes, and how does that affect the disease? Preclinical research, what do we do about um, developing those tools for preclinical research? Um, we try to develop cell models. Um, and this is an area where your contribution was fundamental because you were the one who gave those skin biopsies and our, our um, investigators found a way to transform those skin biopsies into stem cells. And from those stem cells, we can make uh, the uh, cells that are more affected in, in FA heart cells, brain cells, that then investigator can use to study the disease. They can also not only make the cells, but they can also make like human tissue or human organ in a, in a tissue that are called organoids, mini heart, mini brains in a dish where they, that they can use to, to test uh, drugs. And also animal models. As I said, um, we need animal models to, to test whether a drug um, is um, has some efficacy and whether a drug is safe before we can put it in into a person and and then we we can we also um, uh, fund the development of some assays uh, like a potency assay for drugs these are three very good example of grants that we have funded in the last month or so um, from three investigators on developing those tools. Esther Beckett at the University of Oxford, she's making those mini brains, actually she's making mini cerebellum <laughs> in a dish to test drugs and study what happens in the cerebellum, uh, in the human cerebellum, um, in vitro, in a, in a tube. Um, Shannon Boy at the University of Florida, she's making a new mouse model for FA, specifically a mouse model of vision loss in FA because she wants to, um, to test a therapy, a gene therapy for vision loss. And Rob Wilson is making a fish model of FA. I know it's a little bit weird, but sometimes <laughs> we need to um, we need to use different animals, different animal models to recapitulate all the different aspects of FA. FA is a very complex disease. There are multi tissue, multi multiple tissues that are affected, and sometimes using mice is not enough, and we need a, a different animal to test what we cannot recapitulate in uh, in mice. Obviously, animals are not people, so it's it's hard that to find the one model that uh, represents FA fully. And finally, um, what do we fund as far as, you know, helping clinical research, helping clinical trials? Um, biomarker uh, development is, is, you know, an important aspect. We try to fund uh, research that develops new biomarkers for FA. You probably all have heard about Track FA, this big a study, international study that um, uh, 
follows, measures the, the brain and the spinal cord in people with FA over time to try to see if that represents the progression of the disease and, and maybe see if that measure can be used in clinical trial to test if a, if a drug is effective or not, and that's a biomarker, uh, and the natural history study. Once again, this is a uh, this is a part of research where your contribution is essential, as Jen mentioned earlier. Um, our the clinical um, the natural history study is now uh, being the F the uh, U.S. national uh, natural history study is now being um, um, unified with that's the name of the study uh, with the. Um, uh, European natural history study. So the, the new uh, study is going to be called UNIFI um, and uh, it's going to be run through an international um, consortium of centers that is the FAGCC. And you see over, oops, didn't mean to do that, but you see over here all the centers all over the world that are involved in this, um, in this multinational study. Um, Examples of um, uh, grants that tackle all those questions, biomarkers, uh, and um, some of the measure, the outcome measures that we can um, uh, utilize in clinical trials. Um, the first one is a collaboration between a Brazilian um, researcher and, um, um, and investigators in Australia. And in this case, uh, these investigator are, uh, investigators are trying to use AI, artificial intelligence, to develop uh, an automated method to read MRI scans of people, of cerebelli of people. Um, Eric Wan and Sub Subramani uh, at the University of Florida are trying to develop a tool to measure frataxin directly in the um, cerebrospinal uh, um, fluid of people. Um, in they, they think this, this could be uh, a way to um, determine whether frataxin changes in the cerebrospinal fluid also represent changes that occur in the brain. And finally, Louis Corbin, this is an undergrad that was funded in the last year or so. She's trying to find measures that are useful for pediatric trials. You've heard, I mean, you're all interested in, um, in uh, when uh, pediatric trials are, are, um, um, are going to be, when trials that, that apply to children will be, are going to be available for chil to children. Um, and, but it's important to have tools tools that we can use for children. And right now we have, for example, as a, a measure of clinical outcome, the MFARS, but we don't know if the MFARS is as useful for children as it is in adults, because it measures some of the activities that uh, are still developing in children, like GATE, for example. And so um, we need specific tools for younger, um, younger FAers. And also we fund some of uh, very early drug development efforts. Um, late stages, we, we leave to the, to the drug developments, the biotech and pharmaceutical companies, but um, we also like to fund very early stage uh, drug development. And um, these are some of the examples, Bernard Dutro and Javier Santos in France and in Argentina are trying to find drugs that can substitute for frataxin function in the cell. And also we find um, some uh, proposals that are looking at drugs that are being developed in other diseases, uh, for example, uh, DMD, Duchenne, uh, to treat the heart, for example. Um, and these investigators think that these drugs can be potentially applied to FA, can be efficacious also in FA. Uh, and so we try to we fund them to um, provide evidence that these drugs are indeed uh, good, could potentially be a good drug uh, for FA as well. 
And so this is, you know, the sum of all the uh, research effort uh, of um, that uh, FAIR has funded over the years. Of course, the approval of OMAV is one of them. You've heard from Jen that a FAIR funded the foundational science that allowed uh, for a rationale to use OMAV in, in FA um, and our, our uh, treatment pipeline uh, that represents uh, where all the um, funding effort um, from FERA, funding research, basic research, uh, some kind of um, translational research uh, went, and this is the result of it. Um, and what I, oops, I wanted to, if we, if we go back to uh, that, our representation of the disease as a process, um, our ultimate goal is to understand these different steps and to um, and as I mentioned earlier, all these different steps are therapeutic opportunities. So we want to fill all these boxes for these different steps with as many um, approaches, uh, therapeutic avenues as possible. Um, so that's my intro. And I wanted to introduce to you now the Affair Fellows. These are um, well, there were supposed to be four, but unfortunately, Chan Feng is, is sick, so it's just three of them. Uh, but these are um, young investigators who have dedicated their early careers to studying FA. Um, we um, we give an, an award. This is the first year that we give this award, the Farrah Fellow Award, that um, allows them to um, to uh, interact with other investigators, with more senior investigators, kind of raise their profile a little bit, help their career, um, and also uh, participate uh, to um, conferences, research conferences, or also conferences like this one where they can interact with, um, with the patient community. So I'll in, uh, introduce the first speaker is Sujai Chandra. She is at Stanford and she's gonna talk about a little bit of her research. Hi, everyone. My name is Sujoti. I am a postdoc at Stanford in Dr. Shinan Wang's lab. Um, so the main focus of my research is uh, the cellular or molecular basis of FA with the aim to identify mitochondrial pathways that, that are altered in Frederick's ataxia patients and that can be targeted using small molecule drugs. So I um, use these FA-induced pluripotent stem cells or iPSCs that are generated by genetically reprogramming the skin cells that, uh, that are derived from patients. And we also then edit them to get an isogenic control iPSCs. And then I further differentiate them into sensory neurons and cardiomyocytes, which are the most, uh, as we know, are the two most important types of cells that are affected in FA. So using these two models from the same uh, patient-derived iPSCs, I am conducting a global uh, unbiased proteomic study uh, to identify proteins that are altered in FA patients compared to the control, and also to see if these pathways, mitochondrial pathways and the proteins are cell type specific. So I will just uh, show you uh, just briefly uh, the models that I have uh, generated in the lab. So on the left, you can see the sensory neurons that I have differentiated from iPSCs. So it takes about a month to uh, differentiate them. So I first generate these neural crest cells that you see uh, in A that are um, that expresses SOX10. Then I further differentiate them into sensory neurons. And uh, these sensory neurons are also proprioceptive and they express pervalbumin and periferin and all the other markers. Um, on the right, you can see a cardiomyocyte model that I have developed. So uh, it's very cool uh, for me to see that these cells actually beat in the culture after you uh, successfully cultured them for a certain time. Uh, so yeah, I'm just using these two models from the same patient and conducting a few uh, proteomic studies. Um, 
Uh, and then I just wanted to briefly talk about another uh, um, focus of my research. So here we are targeting uh, the oxidative stress in FA, uh, as um, I think Barbara and uh, some of the other speakers in the morning they discussed, uh, oxidative stress is a very prominent feature of FA. And we want to target it by using a molecule uh, called, we, are, we call it MR3, that our lab has already discovered and tested in a Parkinson's disease model. So we are targeting this pathway called the mix 60 miro one pathway. It's the mitochondrial pathway. So uh, the protein miro one is actually an outer mitochondrial membrane protein. Uh, so what it does, it, hel it helps the mitochondria to move on the microtubules inside the cell. And also when this miro protein is removed from the surface of the mitochondria, that acts as a signal for those damaged mitochondria to be uh, degraded by mitophagy. So uh, removal of miro is sort of a way for the cells to ensure that it is only keeping functioning, uh, functioning healthy mitochondria and it is degrading the damaged ones. So uh, in FA or in PD, when there is high level of re reactive oxygen species present in the cell, what happens is it causes a conformational change of a pro of an inner mitochondrial membrane protein called MIX60, which then further binds more miro protein and stabilizes the complex. So since there are more miro present on the damaged mitochondria, they can no longer be uh, degraded by mitophagy. So what happens is there are more damaged mitochondria that keeps accumulating in the neurons and the chidomyocytes and further causes death of those cells. So I am using, um, using the two models I described. I am using uh, this Miro Reducer 3 compound that our lab has to see if it has any beneficial effects on both of these models. Um, that's a brief overview of what I'm doing, and I would like to thank Farah for uh, inviting us to participate here, and uh, our lab is at Stanford, and uh, thank you so much for your time. Okay, we'll, we'll take question at the end, so I'm going to uh, ask Xionan Guan, she's at Columbia. Hello everyone, my name is Xiao Nan. I come from Columbia University. Uh, I'm very happy to be here to share my research progress in FA and also very happy to hear your questions, your stories. So I'll give you a brief introduction of my project. My mentor is Dr. Shao Liu, here he is. <laughs> And uh, our lab focuses on using multiple epigenetic editing tools to rescue disease. After hiring this, you must have a question, what is epigenetic editing tool? Let's see this picture. You, you could see my pointer, the green one. So the blue color, the double strand helix curl line, that is our DNA. It's the carrier of our genetic information. What is genetic information? It includes like your skin color, will you like the taste of parsley, or will you be allergic to dairy or some other food? That's a genetic level. Except the DNA, you can see there are also some modification on the DNA, like the orange one here, we call it DNA methylation. And also there are purple circle, that's a histone which is used for DNA to wrap on it, make the DNA very condensed. Because you will stretch our DNA to a straight line, it will be two meter. Our cell very small, right? So to make sure our cell can hold this long DNA, it should be very compressed, can like wrap on this histone. You can, you can see in the histone, there are little tail, and there are some chemical group on it. It's also uh, can regulate this kind of DNA function. This kind of modification can record our life behavior, like how many exercise you did every week, what kind of food you eat. It also can record your environment. So this kind of epigenetic uh, information is, uh, is won't affect our DNA sequence. It's just a modification on the DNA but it can affect genes function. For example, it can regulate the genes function if it's not correct, it may cause some disease. 
So the main character of the epigenetic is reversible, which means we can rewrite this kind of epigenetic information for ourselves. How to achieve this? To achieve this goal, our lab developed a CRISPR-Cas9 based on tool, which we call its epigenetic editing tool. CRISPR-Cas9 is a very fancy technology in the um, modern science uh, field, and it won the Nobel Prize in 2020. Uh, because of the limitation of time, I want to introduce more. If you have interest, uh, we can talk later. And uh, our lab uh, adapts this tool to fill in with some writer or eraser or our or the epigenetic information so that we can chill, write some information there or also remove some information. For example, we, we can add the, with some like this orange uh, modification, like we can consider as a hat for the DNA. Also, you can see the one in the purple one, we can consider as a scarf for the DNA sequence. Our lab has successfully applied this kind of editing tool to very specific and also very accurate to edit our epigenetic information, especially in patients, then we can correct it to a health condition. We have applied this tool in multiple diseases like Rett syndrome and also fragile X syndrome. Then how we apply it to fragile uh, te uh, taxia? So as uh, you may already know, in the genetic level, the fragile taxia was caused by the mutation in the gene FXN. It's a repeat region was expanded. That's where lay the uh, genes product, the fratexin from in the patient uh, cells, the product level very low. Except the genetic level, we also check the epigenetic level. For example, in the left side is the epigenetic modification in patient. And the right side is the health people's epigenetic information. For example, you will say DNA methylation level, you can in the DNA, in the patient, it have a little hat that we call DNA methylation modification. It's just some chemical group. But in the health people, we don't have this hat on your DNA. And then also we can say in the histone level, there are some scarf, we call it the histone acetylation in the helps people, but uh, we couldn't find this kind of modification. We couldn't find the scarf in the patient cells. So the, here is our question. Is this epigenetic different will affect the fragile taxia? If we can rewrite this epigenetic information, could we rescue this disease? So we have a test in the cells. So for the DNA methylation to remove the head from DNA, we have two of which name it a DCAS9 type. You don't need to remember this complicated uh, scientific term. You just remember it's a eraser of your eraser of head of the DNA sequence. And they also we have specific tool to add a scarf on the histone. We call it a, a DCPU F1 P300. You just remember it's a writer of the scarf to your DNA. So we apply this tool in the uh, fragile taxia patient derived IPLC. Uh, here I really want to appreciate uh, our patient donate this for, for the research. It's really helpful. And also we uh, first we successfully edit the IPLC. We then we evaluate after this kind of editing, did it rescue the expression level of fratexin? Because that's a very important gene for, for the fragile taxia. Also, we want to evaluate after this kind of editing, will the cells function like the mitochondria function, or also the neurons activity was really rescued or not? Here is some of our very preliminary data. You can say, let's say the first uh, first bar on the left. There are three bar. The very left one is uh, our goal. That's the health people's effects expression level. The middle bar is the patient's expression level. So we know where we should move to. Then let's see how our tools works. You can see the very right bar. That's our uh, DNA methylation editing tool, which to remove the head from the DNA sequence. You can see it increased a little bit, like roughly 1.7 for the change. And also we use other tool to add a scarf to your histone. Uh, we use it both in IPLC, also in the neuron cell. We can solve roughly two-fold increase. Well, very exciting to solve this result. 
because that means demethylation histone modification, this kind of epigenetic information is did involved in the fragile TCS progress, and we can use our tool to rescue this kind of disease. Meanwhile, we also noted there's still some space we can improve to make our tool work better, to rescue this gene's pressure level more higher, to achieve the health control group. Uh, in the future, we are trying to first we are trying to optimize this tool. Meanwhile, you can see the different tools, for example, add the scarf or remove the head, both works. But how about you we more them together? Well, it's both the rescue efficiency. We are trying on that thing. So last but not least, I want to appreciate the federal support to our study. And I also want to appreciate our excellent collaborator, Professor Jorini and her team at Columbia University. And also I want to appreciate our lab member uh, here. Oh, sorry. This are our lab member. Thank you. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Let me advance. Sorry. I'm not qualified to give this presentation. <laughs> oh, here it is. All right. So next is Puere um, Yamayogo is from UT Southwestern, UT University of Texas. Thank you. It's a big deal to speak uh, after a great scientist uh, like my co-fellow, and I will try anyway. Okay. I'm glad to present my project using antisense oligonucleotide against uh, FA. What is antisense oligonucleotide ASO? It's uh, this green piece one. It's a short nuclear acid molecule that can be used to target specific region of RNA. And through this mechanism, they can inhibit or increase gene expression. And because they can modulate the level of the protein, they are used as drug. And the action requires high complementarity with the target sequence, makes them more specific compared to the conventional drugs. Also, by chemical modification, we can increase the stability and some may be administrated just two or three times a year. This kind of drug can be quickly developed and can be specified for patients with rare mutation. And for all this reason, uh, this approach has developed to have a innovative drugs against cancers and genetic disease. And the USA FDA approved some, encouraging the initiation of new projects. My job is to investigate a therapeutic approach for FA using antisense oligonucleotide. How? Nyam Pierla Lab has uh, reported the presence of an aberrant mRNA in the cells of the patient with GAA expansion. And this aberrant uh, uh, mRNA is named here Frataxin ETT. And during the transcription of the frataxin gene, we have also this aberrant one who can decrease the level of the normal frataxin. So we hypothesize that it's possible to use azo to decrease its level and increase the level of the normal mRNA by using antisense oligonucleotide to block the sudden exon. How it's work? After the transcription, we have the pre-mRNA with the exon and the intron. And this pre-mRNA need to be placed into the mature mRNA. And we can use ASO to target the pre-mRNA and uh, disrupt the reconnection by the splicing factors. So instead to have two mRNA, if we target the pseudo mRNA, we will have only a normal one, a single one. And to test the feasibility of our approach, we design an ASO targeting a normal mRNA. And we observe a reduction of this mRNA in uh, uh, the cells of patient, providing proof that it's possible to use this approach to reduce mRNA on frataxin gene. 
currently, uh, I am testing around 15 ASO targeting principally the sudden exon to decrease his level in uh, the patient, hoping to have the best one for future therapeutic. Uh, according to what my experiment on fa patient fibroblast NPCs before the ultimate test uh, on most model brain. This will be uh, my little contribution to our victory against FA. My name is Puire Yamiego. I am uh, in Dr. Mareka lab uh, la uh, as a postdoc. May I receive his greeting. Thank you, Farah, for your support. Thank you, everyone. Great, thank you. Um, are there any questions for regarding research funding or to our very talented young investigators regarding their projects? Or um, maybe we can start by, uh, you told us a little bit about yourself. Um, how did you end up working on FA? <laughs> One thing to start. Um, yeah, so uh, I am a fifth, uh, fifth year postdoc actually, but my PhD training and also my uh, first postdoc at UCLA both were on Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease. And when I joined uh, Dr. Wang's lab at Stanford, we had uh, just received a grant from Farah. And since Parkinson's disease and uh, Frederick's attacks share a lot of common phenotypes like the accumulation of iron, calcium imbalances, and just both, uh, both have really prominent mitochondrial uh, uh, phenotypes. Uh, so I ended up working uh, for Frederick's ataxia. Uh, right now, I am the uh, only person in our lab that is working on FA. And I'm very excited to, uh, you know, develop all these uh, models. And uh, really thanks to uh, you guys for providing us with all the uh, skin cells and everything that we can um, engineer to um, get many very important cell types that really helps our research. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for something. Uh, hi. Um, actually, I'm present totally in a different field before I started the fragile Hentesia project. I'm in the epigenetic field to see how this epigenetic effect information affects our health and disease. Uh, our lab focuses on multiple brain diseases, as I mentioned earlier, like stress syndrome and also the fragile X syndrome. As you may know, lots of brain disease associated with this kind of repeat expansion. So it's very interested to understand why all the brain disease, most of brain disease social with this kind of mutation, right? And also our collaborator, Jorini, she is in the fragile Tessia field and we found each other to say, how about we apply this epigenetic editing tool in the fragile Tessia because we have some very successful example in other diseases. So that's why how I started this project. Yeah, thank you. I came from Burkina Faso to Canada only to learn molecular biology. And during this PhD, uh, my topic was on FA with uh, Dr. Jacques Petramley in Laval University. And I use uh, uh, CRISPR-Cas9 to delay the GAA repeat. And during my PhD, I have contact with the patient. For example, I saw the patient making the tour of Saint Laurent River to raise money for research. That touched me. And I decided to continue in this way if I have opportunity. And Marek Nyampiella gave me the opportunity to come his lava and to be a postdoc. So I am very glad to contribute for something in this disease. Thank you. Yeah. timeline yeah so uh we uh just it really depends on um 
uh, how fast we can, for at least for me, how fast we can get the cells that we need for our uh, different experiments. So right now I am uh, working with these two models, the sensory neuron and the cardiomyocytes, which takes about one month to just get one round of differentiation done. So it's definitely a little time consuming, but uh, yeah, we are hoping to finish this in the next uh, one year or so, because uh, that will be my end of postdoc also, hopefully at Stanford. So yeah, we are hoping, uh, we are already done with uh, one of our uh, proteomic screen in the sensory neurons. So we hope to see very um, exciting data from there and we will move for forward with that, yeah. Uh, I start this project from one year ago. Uh, as you may know, this kind of tool is very specific to specific gene. You can design whatever gene you can target. So we designed this SDR into this specific FXN gene and apply it to IPSC and also apply it to a neuron, which is our final goal. It's, uh, the, the data I show here kind of like a one year's work. And in the future, first I will keep on working on this model to make it, it works better. Meanwhile, we also try to apply to the mouse experiment to see where it's working in vivo conditions and it's more close to the clinical treatment. So, uh, hard for me to give the exactly time like when could we successfully successfully achieve this uh, goals but uh, we are working on it and hopefully we can have some clinical application as soon as possible thank you i am a three-month postdoc researcher and uh, uh, for my project to in vitro until in vivo we plan for two or three years but during this period, we will also do another thing like uh, the patient with point mutation. We also want to use ASO to uh, try to find a therapeutic. Thank you. So, so first I wanna congratulate everyone um, because you have some really great science and really um, proposing some really great um, experiments. I had a specific question for, uh, Jaunan, about your uh, CRISPR strategy. On the timeline, the in vitro timeline you presented, um, you're going to perform the editing at the IPSC stage before differentiation. Yes. Is there a plan um, or is it possible to try this strategy after the cells have been uh, fully differentiated into their uh, target adult cell type? Yeah, definitely. Uh, first, we are trying on the IPSC. It's kind of like stem cell of the 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 the, the fragile cell uh, attacks their patient stem cell. So after we you we can choose this kind of editing in the stem cell. Later, we can always differentiate this this cell to like a neurons or the heart cells, which is we really want to choose this kind of editing. And the, the other side, we are also trying to directly edit in the, you know, differentiated cell, like neuron cell and heart cell. That's more close to the clinical uh, uh, application. That's what we are working on, yeah. Thank you. Anybody else? If not, I just want to thank again these wonderful young investigators. They're so talented. Thank you so much for working on it.